The House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee will come to order uh, without objection. The chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any point, and all members will have five days to submit statements, extraneous material, and questions for the record subject to the length limitations in the rules. To insert something into the record, please have your staff email the previously mentioned address and contact full committee staff. Please keep your video function on at all times, even when you're not recognized by the chair. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves, and please remember to mute yourself after you finish speaking. Consistent with House Resolution 965 and in the accompanying regulations, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when they're not under recognition to eliminate background noise. I see that we have a quorum. Thank you all for being here, and now I'll recognize myself for opening remarks. Pursuant to notice, we are holding a hearing today entitled Green Recovery Plans for the COVID-19 Crisis. One year ago, we held a hearing to coincide with the UN's Climate Action Summit, where a panel of youth climate activists testified before the subcommittee about the urgency of addressing the climate crisis. Today, one year later, that urgency has only grown. This year's Climate Week is a joint effort by the Climate Group along uh, with the United Nations and the City of New York to bring together a broad range of stakeholders to address how we rebuild after this global COVID-19 pandemic. The safety measures we had to put into place to protect public health have been crippling economically with millions unemployed and entire sectors of the economy decimated. Despite these measures, the virus itself has taken over 200,000 American lives and nearly 1 million deaths globally. As we all should have come to realize at this point, we cannot simply wish the virus away. We must wear masks and social distance, and by doing so, we will actually diminish the effects of this so we can get back to family, to work, and to everything and everyone that we miss. Similarly, we can't wish away the economic realities resulting from this virus. Americans should not have to choose between their health and their economic security. In the near term, we must support the communities hardest hit uh, by this temporary crisis. And for the longer term, we must begin planning a more sustainable and sensible economic recovery, one that harnesses American ingenuity, one that will leave us more economically secure and enhance our environmental and public health. As we speak, unprecedented wildfire, wildfires, storms, floods are ravaging our country destroying homes, lives, and livelihoods. How much death and destruction from a changing climate will we watch before we act? The choice before us is obvious. We could continue throwing money at short-term fixes, band-aids that throw away money on outdated solutions and destruction from a challenging climate uh, that we'll continue to watch before we act. The choice before us is obvious. We should continue we, we could continue throwing money on short-term fixes, band-aids that throw away money on, on these solutions uh, that can't possibly solve the problems of our 21st century communities. Or we could invest strategically in technologies, the ideas and the initiatives that buoy our economy and develop jobs and industries to stabilize the financial crisis sparked by this pandemic and create safer, healthier, more sustainable communities for decades and generations to come. Governments around the world are facing the same choice. However, they're not hesitating to develop economic relief plans that address not only the pain from the pandemic, but also the inevitable pain we will continue to experience from climate change. They're using economic recovery or economic stimulus funding as an opportunity to incentivize cleaner technologies and promote jobs and clean and renewable energy that will be cheaper, safer, more efficient, and less vulnerable to geopolitical disruptions. For example, the EU has allocated 20% of its 2020 stimulus spending towards green priorities. I see the potential for these opportunities in my own district where we're creating high paying jobs through investments in offshore wind, bringing together universities and community colleges, American businesses, and international partners. 
our European counterparts have seen an incredible range of opportunities from jobs and economic growth as they tackle the existential threat of climate change. We've got work to do to catch up to them. I have legislation to support these kinds of investments, ensure that local workforce is prepared for the opportunities in the offshore wind industry. The House will also be voting this week on a package of meaningful reforms to move us close to realizing our clean energy future, but there's still so much that we can and must do. The private sector understands this. Rarely does a day go by without a company announcing steps towards zero emission goals. That's why it's so disheartening that this is still a debate here in the U.S. and that we are not all working furiously together, driving forcefully towards obvious and clear solutions like countless businesses across the private sector and like so many of our foreign partners are doing right now. Americans see the reality before them. They've fled furious infernos with nothing but the clothes on their backs as their homes and livelihood burns in the rearview mirror. Others have diligently boarded up homes and businesses in nervous anticipation of the waters brought by rising seas and crushing storms, fully aware of the inevitability of the wreckage to come. Americans of all ages and all backgrounds see what's coming, as do the people around the world. It's a false choice between our economy and the health care of our people and our planet. We can and must act to protect all of these things. So I'm eager for the conversation today with our panel of experts, and hopefully we can begin to shape a responsible and sustainable economic response to this pandemic. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today, and I now turn to the ranking member for his opening remarks. Representative well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for calling the hearing and to the panel. Thank you for being uh, with us today in this new, unique way of doing it. Uh, while the coronavirus pandemic has caused incalculable human suffering across the U.S. and around the world, we now do have the opportunity to rebuild our communities, economies, and our environment. It's still incredible to me to see photos right after the lockdowns took effect where people in India could see the Himalayas for the first time in their lives because the smog from factories had cleared or in Italy where the once polluted canals Representative uh, Kinziger, I think you've gone mute. If we could uh, post, just suspend for a second and see if we can change, check this technologically. We're pausing for one moment, uh, Representative, just to make sure. Uh, I just want to okay from uh, everyone that the technologies created and uh, Representative Kinsey can, can start from his opening remarks if he chooses with a full time component. Just like a sound check, can uh, Chesson, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, sir. Uh, should we test uh, Representative Kinzinger again? Dennis became. Chesson, is he uh, freezing on your screen or is it just mine? Now he's gone from the screen, Mr. Chairman. I see. Well, we'll, we'll wait, see if that can be done in uh, for another uh, minute or so, and then we can proceed. Uh, what I'll do, uh, I'm going to go through the witness introductions next. Uh, and then we'll try uh, Representative Kinzinger, and uh, if the technology is not corrected, uh, we're going to uh, we'll go and proceed in another order. So uh, let me take this uh, pause to introduce our witnesses, and I'd like to thank them for joining us. Uh, dean Kite is a dean of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. She previously served as special representative 
of the United Nations Secretary General and Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All, where she led efforts to promote and finance clean energy to further the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals. She was also Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change at the World Bank Group. Thank you for joining us. Mr. John E. Morton is partner at Pollination and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He currently serves as a senior fellow at the European Climate Foundation. He previously served as White House Senior Director for Energy and Climate Change at the National Security Council during the Obama administration. Thank you for being here. Dr. Jonas Nam is an Assistant Professor of Energy Resources and Environment at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. His research focuses on the intersection of economic and industrial policy, energy policy, and environmental politics. Dr. Dalibor Rohawk is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise uh, Institute, where he focuses on European political and economic trends. He's currently uh, a visiting junior fellow at the Max Belloff Center of Study of Liberty and at the University of Buckingham in the UK and a fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs in London. Now, uh, let's see if we can uh, move back to uh, Ranking Member Kinzinger's opening remarks. Uh, if we have a delay, then I'll recognize uh, Representative Wilson if, if you're prepared. I, I, let's go back to uh, Representative Kinzinger. I believe we have him back. Representative Kinzinger. Uh, yeah, you do. You can start from the beginning uh, with your opening remarks. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Sorry, guys. Glad you've joined us again. Yeah, me too. Let me know if I cut out again, and uh, then you can move on, and we'll do it after. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you to the panel. Thank you for being here. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, this uh, pandemic's caused a lot of uh, human suffering around the U.S. and the world, and we have the opportunity now to rebuild our communities, our economy, and our environment. It's still incredible to see the photos after the lockdown took effect, where people in India could see Himalayas. For the first time in their life, and the smog from the factories had cleared, or in Italy, where the once polluted canals of Venice became crystal clear. In China, we saw air pollution drop almost 11% because of COVID restrictions. And it's a shame to see that these numbers have risen back to pre-COVID levels, but there is a silver lining. Through American leadership and innovation, we can reverse the damage that we've done and ensure a clean environment for the next generation. But before we even discuss the important role that green technology plays in our world, the U.S., and our European allies must hold the world's top polluter, China, accountable. We must not forget that for every ton of carbon dioxide reduced by the U.S., China adds nearly four times as much. So while the U.S. works to clean the air we breathe, China pollutes it. Additionally, the U.S. government, in coordination with the private sector, needs to ensure that American innovation can flourish in a post-COVID environment. If we begin slapping unnecessary regulations on the energy sector, we're only going to suffocate the entrepreneurial spirit of the United States. And last but not least, we must stress the importance of energy diversification. Not only will energy diversity stimulate weakened economies, but it'll help to provide the energy security to nations around the world that we need. Take my district, Illinois 16th Congressional District. It's home to four nuclear power generating stations, which serves as the most abundant and clean energy source on the planet, as well as hundreds of wind turbines, solar power, and geothermal sources. This strategy is beneficial as it supports good paying jobs at home while also ensuring we're good stewards of our environment. That's why I applaud Poland's decision to not only invest in nuclear power for their country, but also to increase their LNG trade with the United States while supporting intra-EU energy transit. It's these kinds of decisions that will not only have a long-term benefit on protecting our climate, but will also push back on Russia's use of energy as a political weapon. If Western society wants to tackle climate change, we must hold polluters accountable and invest in long-term solutions to our energy needs, and I believe that nuclear must be part of that strategy. Unfortunately, we've seen some of our closest allies take their nuclear reactors offline at a time when we need low-carbon energy sources. Germany, for example, shut down nearly half of their nuclear power stations overnight. Additionally, they scheduled their remaining reactors to close over a decade before shutting, shuttering their coal plants, which still generate over a third of their energy. Now, we all, know, we, we all know that for Germany to achieve their green energy goals, they decided to build a pipeline directly from Russia into Germany. And we have all discussed the reasons as to why this is a terrible idea. 
I'm still amazed that the German government is willing to work with the Kremlin after they interfered in Western elections, invaded our allies in Ukraine and Georgia, shot down a commercial airliner, killing over 200 EU citizens, staged a cyber attack on the German parliament, murdered a Russian opponent in Berlin, and bolstered the Assad regime's genocide in Syria. I commend Germany for reconsidering the Nord Stream 2 pipeline after Russia's assassination attempt recently, but we cannot rely on them to put the final nail in the coffin. Congress must act and ensure that as long as Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation continue to threaten the transatlantic partnership, Nord Stream 2 will never play a role in Europe's green recovery plan. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for the technical difficulties, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank the ranking member. Uh, and I want to recognize the witnesses for five minutes uh, without objection. Your prepared written statements will be made part of the record. Uh, uh, Mr. Kite, uh, you're now recognized for your opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking minority member and members of the committee. Mr. Kite, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning uh, on the critical issue of how we can build back better from the global economic crisis brought about by COVID. Uh, the con let me just update the context. More than 90 countries are seeking support from the International Monetary Fund. More than 180 countries have stalled or shrinking growth, according to the World Bank, which now warns that COVID-19 could push countries from recession into depression. And at the UN General Assembly going on in New York this week or virtually around the world, reports on progress towards the sustainable development goals highlight that 100 million people are at risk of being pushed back into poverty and that by some measures of well-being the past 25 weeks have wiped out 25 years of progress so the pandemic presents us with an extraordinary challenge but also an extraordinary once in a generation opportunity the imf currently projects and we can assume that these will be updated in the next few weeks that um, the extent of the growth challenge is that global growth retreats by approximately 5% in 2020. So then how do we organize immediate relief and plan for recovery? And can that recovery be one that puts individual economies and the global economy on a more inclusive pathway and a cleaner pathway? Well, at least more than 200 economists writing earlier this summer think so, and they concluded in work brought together by the University of Oxford that green stimulus measures can have the most significant impact on the economy, cutting emissions. So they highlighted investing in building efficiency retrofits, education and training to address immediate unemployment from COVID-19, clean energy physical infrastructure, storage and renewable energy assets, for example, clean energy R&D and natural capital for ecosystem resilience and regeneration. OECD estimates that more than 30 member countries and key partners have now announced green stimulus elements, mainly in energy and transport. And lessons from the last financial crisis show that if well designed, they can achieve a twin objective of providing income and jobs while improving well-being and resilience. The International Energy Agency, working with the IMF, published a plan for sustainable recovery focused on the energy sector here, they think there can be growth stimulated of 1.1% a year, and also that we could create 9 million jobs a year and reduce energy-related emissions by 4.5 billion tonnes. They were explicit that there is a sweet spot where short-term job creation, growth in the short to medium term, and medium to long-term emissions can be achieved. That sweet spot is refurbishing buildings, improving energy efficiency, in improving uh, the electricity sector, in particular upgrading grids with deep employment opportunities, and renewable energy, essentially focusing uh, the recovery efforts there. Energy efficiency can be important too, including in manufacturing, food and textile industries. So there is a sweet spot. The short, medium and long-term objectives can be achieved by a green recovery. Now, many countries are introducing uh, green elements, some of them very far reaching, using the opportunity for reset, for example, Chile looking at a green hydrogen economy. But it is the European Union that has attracted the most attention. Came forward with a green deal in December last year, and then in July this year, as the, the chairman has already indicated, uh, a, a package of $572 billion, a large part of the recovery to be green, focusing on electric vehicles, renewable energy and agriculture, as, as well as other sectors. 
What's interesting is that that then is being joined by the announcement by the EU in the recent days that they will ratchet up their climate ambition, targeting a 55% reduction in emissions over 1990 levels by 2030. So a number of jurisdictions around the world, middle-income advanced economies are using this opportunity to double down. And so I would like to make three points in conclusion. First, the nature of this crisis means that it is a once in a generation opportunity to pivot and ensure economic future protects people and the planet. Secondly, there are sweet spots of actions spurring immediate job growth, boasting incomes and achieving emissions. And then thirdly, the private sector and investors are increasingly moving to zero net emissions trajectories themselves and demanding stronger government signaling so that they can go further faster. Government action is essential to ensure that we don't leave anyone behind. That will be important for developing countries as well. But the virus has shown that limits of our resilience, we need to be resilient to the impact of climate change and not investing in that now as part of this extraordinary recovery would be detrimental in the short and long term. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dean Kite. Uh, now I'll call upon Mr. Morton for your uh, opening statement. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member uh, Kinzinger, and members of the committee, it's a real pleasure uh, to testify before you here today. My name is John Morton. I'm a partner at Pollination, a global advisory and investment firm, and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. The transition to a global low carbon economy represents the most predictable and consequential economic transformation in human history. Over the coming decades, tens of millions of, doll, of jobs and trillions of dollars of wealth will be created as we transition to a cleaner, more efficient, and more resilient economy. The question is not whether this transition will occur, but rather how fast, who will lead, and who will be left behind. These are questions of tremendous economic consequence for corporations, for industries, and for nations. The COVID crisis, as has been said, represents an opportunity to align public investment with this ongoing global transitioning, turbocharging the technologies and industries of today and tomorrow. Carbon is a dangerous pollutant, quickly warming our planet, and it is emitted at virtually zero cost. In economic terms, that makes carbon the ultimate unpriced externality. But that is beginning to change and fairly rapidly. The World Bank reports that there are now more than 60 carbon pricing initiatives at the national or subnational level in place or under development. Together, jurisdictions covered under these programs account for nearly one quarter of global GHG emissions. In short, carbon is fast becoming a financial liability. Financial markets know this. In January, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink wrote, quote, we are on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. Investors are recognizing that climate risk is investment risk. The Commodities Futures Trading Commission concurred two weeks ago, stating that, quote, climate change poses a major risk to the stability of the U.S. financial system and to its ability to sustain the American economy. Investments today in more climate resilient solutions are prudent not only to minimize future costs, but because they will generate outsized returns. Recent analysis from the International Renewable Energy Agency shows that investments that expedite moving to a low carbon economy would increase global GDP by nearly $100 trillion by 2050. As has been said, countries around the world recognize this and are responding accordingly in their recovery plans. France has earmarked more than 30% of its most recent recovery package for climate action. South Korea has prepared an ambitious Green New Deal with a five-year focus on clean energy, electric and hydrogen vehicles, and energy efficiency. But the best example of leadership can be found in Europe, where the European Commission has announced a nearly $900 billion next-generation EU program, with nearly 40% of these funds to be allocated directly to the objectives of the European Green New Deal. Highlights include increasing uh, emissions reductions targets, notably, as Dean Kite mentioned, a goal of becoming the first climate neutral continent by 2050, and notably, developing a WTO compatible carbon border adjustment mechanism. Let's pause just for a moment on that last point. The moment isn't too far off where carbon intensive of products will be explicitly taxed or tariffed in order to enter the European just because we reductions does not mean that others won't, and increasingly in ways that will be painful for our economy. So what should the U.S. do? 
We must use this moment of crisis to propel the U.S. back into an economic leadership position by supporting the jobs and industries of the future. And when the climate challenge is looked at through the lens of future jobs and growth, the following investment priorities become compelling economic opportunities. Continued rapid develop, a deployment of clean and renewable energy, electrification of the transportation sector and build out of a national charging infrastructure, development of next generation energy storage solutions and a domestic clean hydrogen industry, improvements in building and energy efficiency, and importantly, investments in nature and nature-based solutions, including landscape, restoration, regenerative agriculture, and sustainable forestry. Wayne Gretzky, the NHL hockey great, once said that you must, quote, skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And in the case of the transition to a global low-carbon economy, the puck's direction of travel could not be clearer. And there are many countries now racing to intercept its trajectory. The U.S. should move quickly and deliberately, deliberately just as the U.S. led the global economy in the 20th century, let's use this crisis to ensure that we lead the industries of the 21st century as well. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Morton, for your statements and, and your uh, perspective. Uh, now I'll turn to Dr. Nam, your opening statements. Uh, Chairman Keating, Ranking Member Kinzinger, members of the committee, thank you uh, so much for this opportunity to discuss possibilities for a green recovery, uh, particularly as they relate to clean energy industries and U.S. competitiveness. On a personal, I, I became a citizen exactly two weeks ago today, so I'm particularly honored to serve as a witness here so soon after taking uh, the oath. The economic recession caused by efforts to contain the global pandemic has, in the short term, led to a drop of global greenhouse gas emissions. But as I lay out in more detail in my written statement, three factors caution against optimism that the recession will yield a green recovery. First, these emissions reductions during the current recession have been temporary. They're unlikely to have a lasting impact on global efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by themselves. Second, uh, G20 economies have thus far spent far less on green recovery programs than in the aftermath of the 2009 recession. Since March, uh, my colleagues and I at Johns Hopkins University have been tracking cl climate-related spending and stimulus packages in G20 economies. And our findings are preliminary and the research is ongoing. But as early results suggest, uh, only 7% of fiscal stimulus so far targets a green recovery. Roughly the same amount of money has been spent supporting fossil fuel industries. For comparison, in 2009, roughly 15% of stimulus spending in G20 economies focused on green recovery programs. That said, a number of European economies, as well as South Korea, have considerably outspent the United States on measures to boost competitiveness of their clean energy industries. Governments have used stimulus packages to accelerate investments in infrastructure, support clean energy industries, fund research and development efforts. A particular focus in Europe has been renewable energy, electrification of transportation, and investments in research on hydrogen technologies. Green recovery funds have also uh, green recovery plans have also funded incentives, including incentives uh, for electric vehicles, tax credits for building retrofits, rebates for energy efficiency, and so on. And some European governments have begun to make financial support for the private sector conditional on future emissions reductions and changes to business practices. Nonetheless, many economies have also compensated fossil fuel sectors at the same time, again offering little indication that this is a comprehensive shift toward decarbonization. A third reason for pessimism about global efforts to address the climate crisis relates to China. The pandemic has further strained economic and political relationships with China, and this is detrimental to efforts to mitigate climate change. China produces 60% of the world's solar panels. It uh, is the world's largest producer of electric cars. It makes over one third of global wind turbines. It's also home to over two thirds of the world's production capacity for lithium ion batteries that we need for electric cars and for storage in part because of China's massive investments in manufacturing, clean energy technologies have seen rapid cost declines over the past decade. A green economic recovery is an opportunity to invest in domestic clean energy industries and to reduce reliance on China in the long term, but in the limited time frame, time frame remaining to sufficiently reduce emissions, a green recovery will also need to rely on clean energy technologies that are currently manufactured in China. The United States is uniquely equipped to be at the global frontier of clean energy innovation. Historically, we've been the largest investor in clean energy research and development. We continue to lead in many areas critical for fixing the climate crisis. 
This includes next generation solar technologies, advanced battery chemistries, new building materials, smart grid technologies, software to complex man uh, manage complex energy systems and so on. The United States should use this opportunity to rapidly accelerate its, its research and development investments to defend this technological lead. In the long term, the current recession also offers an opportunity to improve conditions for segments of clean energy supply chains that are currently not well supported domestically. This might mean support for domestic manufacturing, for instance, through the creation of financing institutions for manufacturing, through renewed investments in vocational training and technical colleges. In the short term, however, we should not lose sight of the immediate economic benefits from green recovery, and that is true even if a share of these technologies is, for now, manufactured abroad. Investments in clean energy infrastructure, upgrades to the grid, sustainable transit solutions, renewable energy installations, building ret retrofits, they all would create local jobs in construction and in installation and maintenance and in related service industries. Green recovery spending would support the creation of such jobs in the near term. It would improve U.S. competitiveness in the long term, and it would also rapidly deploy capital in the economy to aid the recovery now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Nguyen. The chair now recognizes Dr. Roja uh, for your opening statement. Um, Chairman Keating, um, Ranking Member Kinsinger, member of the subcommittee, uh, thank you very much indeed for this opportunity to share my views on mostly the geopolitical and energy security implications of the European Union's climate policies. Um, so my take will be somewhat narrower than uh, than, than, than of the, um, other witnesses. As with many uh, other EU initiatives, I believe there is a mismatch between the significant ambitions that the European Green Deal and the more recent decisions on, on spending uh, have and the tools and policies that are available to the EU as a bloc to achieve those ambitions. Uh, and I think that makes it all the more important for Europe, for the United States to engage constructively on energy policy uh, with our European partners. Uh, not least because many of these issues uh, have far reaching geopolitical ramifications. The State of the Union address to the European Parliament, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the European Commission, reiterated the EU's commitment to uh, become a fir the first climate neutral continent by 2050 and to reduce emissions by 55% relative to the 1990 levels. Um, also, the Commission has vowed to prepare all the legislation needed to meet those targets uh, by the summer of next year. Most importantly, the uh, financial package that was agreed on in the aftermath of uh, the first wave of the COVID pandemic in Europe involves one third of the resources uh, of overall 1.8 trillion euros to be allocated to, um, to climate change uh, policies and to, into investment, uh, into emissions reductions. It sounds like a lot, but on an annualized basis, so this is a seven year financial framework, this really accounts for less than 2% uh, of, of GDP, uh, I mean, the overall, overall EU budget, including the financial package for, uh, for post COVID recovery. Those 30% for climate change policies are not exactly new. So this is something that was really envisaged uh, last year already. So, so there hasn't been a massive shift in the EU's policies over the recent, over the recent months, I think that's yes, worth yes, stressing. And I think what the, um, what the uh, European Green Deal and this financial package leaves out is as important as, as what it actually includes. Um, so most importantly, uh, energy policies are not fully within the control of, of the European Union. Member states have their own national policies, have their own priorities, and, uh, and, and, and the way these are coordinated and, and reconciled with these ambitious carbon uh, emissions reduction goals, uh, are, you know, this is not a technical exercise. This is something that will involve a lot of political balancing and, and quite delicate work. Um, one significant gap uh, that I see in the EU initiatives has to do with the R&D research and development budget and the forward-looking programs uh, that have been reduced under pressure from, from, from member states that require uh, spending that involves uh, as little uh, strings attached as, as possible. So, so the R&D um, has been reduced and, and some of these other uh, auxiliary funds that 
were meant to facilitate the transition to carbon free uh, economy have been have been have been slashed. Um, the open question is the role for nuclear energy. Um, of course, across the EU, um, European countries have wildly different takes on um, what role uh, nuclear energy should play in the future. I think that has geopolitical ramifications as well, given uh, the role of Russia and Russia uh, Russia's uh, nuclear monopolist in, in, in the nuclear sectors of many European, particularly Central and Eastern European economies. Uh, the other question, obviously, is the reliance on Russian gas and the spare capacity built by Russia with these pipelines that enables to cut off supplies to Ukraine and Belarus, for example, without endangering the supplies to the, to the European Union. And I think that's, that's something that is uh, very much uh, in, in the US interest to, 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 to tackle. So I believe that the United States needs to engage. Um, it is in the US interest that the EU makes strides towards reducing its carbon footprint and also uh, that energy be not used as a tool by Russia and China to uh, increase its influence uh, in Europe. Um, and I think that uh, involves, uh, in practical terms, the support for a host of policies that would enable US and EU energy companies to keep that technological edge. Uh, and also friendly pressure on our European partners not to, uh, not to compromise EU and US strategic interests with projects like Nord Stream. So on that note, I thank you and I look forward to your question. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, uh, and thank all our witnesses for their testimony. I'll now recognize members for five minutes each and pursuant, pursuant to the House rules, all time yielded is for the purpose of questioning our witnesses. Because of the virtual format of this hearing, I'll recognize members by seniority, alternating between Democrat members and Republican members. Uh, if you miss your turn, Please let your staff know, we're gonna circle back to you. Uh, if you seek recognition, you must unmute your microphone and address the chair verbally and obviously as part of the hearing be on the screen. I'll now start uh, by recognizing myself uh, for questions. Seldom do we uh, have testimony uh, that is echoed by all the witnesses uh, that the decisions, the economic decisions in this instance uh, that we're contemplating uh, are the greatest uh, in human history, your words. Uh, but that's where we're at. And that's how important this is. That's how uh, much of an opportunity it can be uh, for our country uh, and our planet, but also uh, how it cannot be. Now, many times uh, we're talking about pieces of paper. Uh, we're talking about policy. It all sounds very wonkish, but my question uh, to Mr. Morton, and if anyone else wants to come in uh, with an answer, is really to discuss the importance of being strategic as a country, as having a policy in place, because we're not in this by ourselves. And, and as our witnesses have said, this is going to go along, this movement is going to go along with us or without us, uh, playing a lead role. I mean, we deal with global supply chains, global production changes, uh, global trade. Uh, so that's why the U.S. needs a strategic policy in place. Can you put into layman's terms or, or communicate the importance of having a concrete policy in place so that we're moving together with the private sector, with other countries of the world, uh, and have an opportunity to lead and benefit from that instead of just muddling through? So many of our policies that we've had hearings on in our full committee it's the policy of muddling through. We can't afford to do that. Mr. Morton. Sure, thank you for the, for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think it's, it's important to recognize that climate change 20 years ago was an environmental concern. Uh, it became a, uh, it became a, or it has become a, a, a human health concern. It's become a moral concern. Uh, it has become a social concern, um, and it is, it is when it has also become an economic concern that we have begun to see in recent years the, uh, the piling on uh, and the understanding now among corporates, among financial institutions, um, among investors, among consumers, that, the, uh, that this train is, is, is leaving the station. And, 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 and I think when you have the alignment of policy uh, um, signals 
as we clearly have from around the world. Um, the fact that 189 countries are, are, are parties to the Paris Agreement, which essentially says when you boil it down, that every five years those parties will come back with increasing levels of ambition around their carbon emissions reductions targets. That's a clear, clear signal of where the world is moving with respect to its uh, with respect to its carbon um, uh, carbon trajectory. And so, when I say this is the most predictable and consequential economic transformation in history, to my mind, what that means is we very we see extremely clearly the direction of travel. There's no question where uh, where the world is moving. And again, the question is just how quickly we're going to get there, and and who will benefit most from it. This is. Yeah, I think it. I, yeah. I think it's more that. Uh, we're going to, we can't wait, and it's already happening. If people look at their own uh, investments, uh, those people that have investments, if people look at their 401ks and they dig deep into the, uh, the reports, they're going to find out there's already calculations in place uh, about the effect of carbonization in terms of the value of their investments and in terms of what the private sector is investing in. Uh, and you, you brought that to light, but this is, uh, do we have to wait till people uh, get so familiar that they're looking at their own uh, pensions or investments uh, and saying, oh, what's what's this factor? Calculating that out. Isn't that going to be commonplace? I, I think it will be. And I think financial institutions in a very short period of time will begin to either voluntarily or have to disclose the carbon content of their of their holdings. And when that happens, you will find, I think, a seismic shift in how uh, in how consumers and and investors treat the carbon uh, intensity of assets, because again, there's two sides to this. One is the carbon, one is the question of how much exposure do you have? And what is the downside to your, to our, as an economy, our exposure to carbon? The other is what is the upside? And this is the important moment that we can recognize today, the upside potential in transitioning faster and smarter. And again, leading this transition as opposed to being left behind. The last thing I'll say is China in 2008 and 2009, and Dr. Nam may, may know more about this than, than many of us, um, put in place a very, very effective and forward-leaning set of, of stimulus packages that, in response to the Great Recession. They looked forward. They said, we're going to dig out of this, but we're going to dig out of this in, in smart ways. They invested in solar, wind, battery technology, EVs. And today they are the, as Dr. Nam said, the leaders in each of those technologies, commanding leaders in each of those technologies, which today are the underpinning of this new economy. So today, the question is, what are we going to do to dig out and to reinvest in a way that positions us as the leaders 10 years hence? And I think that's a question for all of us, but it won't be in high carbon intensive solutions. It'll be in low carbon intensive solutions. Okay. Well, I see the I see the issue in terms of our place in catching up. I see it in my own district, in our own country with green power, uh, where we're, we're behind Europe in much of that. And I'll turn to Representative Kinziger uh, for his question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Nam, congratulations. Just in time for one of the calmest election seasons we've ever had. So uh, congrats on uh, your citizenship. Uh, Dr. Rohawk, I've got a series of questions for you. Uh, why is it important uh, in your mind that Congress takes a lead on ending the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline? And I'll let you know you're on. Yeah, there you go. You're on mute. You were a little quiet in your uh, intro, so if you could make I'll, sure that you're I'll, I'll just speaking move up. to the mic. Um, Perfect. Uh, so, Nord Stream 2 is part of a series of projects undertaken by the Russian government over the past uh, couple of years, of, over, over a decade really, that sought to circumvent the traditional routes through which natural gas was supplied to the European Union, through Ukraine namely, and the spare capacity that's created jointly by Turk Stream, by Nord Stream, and Nord Stream 2 uh, actually creates enough redundancy for Russians to be able to cut off supplies to Ukraine, Belarus, uh, without any consequences for, for the gas contracts to the, the European Union. That gives, obviously, the Kremlin leverage over these countries, creates opportunities to destabilize um, the, the, the central Eastern European neighborhood. Thankfully, uh, there, have been, um, there has been some pushback within the European Union. Partly uh, with the third energy package, there are now competition policy tools that uh, prevent Russians from striking the same sort of contractual deals with individual countries as they were doing in the past. Well, if uh, you, let, me, let me interrupt you for a second. I appreciate that. I, I just have a few more questions, though, on it. But let's say, you know, Germany's considering a Nord Stream 2 moratorium. Can that be easily reversed? And how quickly could that pipeline be finished if they did? Well, the pipeline is almost 
at, at, at the completion stage, right? It's, it's very, very close to the completion. The problem with just a moratorium is that, uh, you know, it can be reversed. Uh, I don't know for how, you know, for how long it, it creates a sort of window of opportunity to just go back to the pipeline. I mean, the economics of the pipeline never really made sense to begin with, especially at these low, uh, low prices. But, uh, but having, uh, you know, a, having a moratorium in place creates the opening to essentially go back to the, to the pipeline in the, in, in, in the future, which is, I, which is why it's important, I think, for, for the United States to put some pressure, albeit on friendly terms, on, on our European partners, on Germany, while offering some sort of off-ramp uh, for, 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 for Germany. I think there is a debate within Germany about Nord Stream 2 and about LNG, uh, discussion of possible LNG terminals in, uh, on, on, the, on the north, north coast of, of Germany. So, so I think there needs to be uh, this two-pronged approach where the United States states clearly that this is not in the US interest, and, 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 and which is, but, but still in a way that's not seen uh, as overly pushy or, 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 or sort of, you know, a hostile act. I, I know that the US-German relations have not been uh, in, in, a, in a great place, but, uh, but I mean, Nord Stream 2 is something that's very much not in the German interest, uh, nor it is in the European interest. Thank you. Let me let me ask you, China's commitments under the Paris Agreement have been recognized as insufficient in slowing down the rise of global temperatures. Why was China, an economic superpower, permitted to make such insufficient commitments in 2015 compared to those by the U.S., EU, and other Western countries? Well, the history is important because um, there was an earlier climate summit in 2009 uh, which failed to bring a binding agreement on emissions targets. So 2015 was in a way about a reality which allowed countries to decarbonize at their own pace. Uh, and, and, and actually, you know, much of what was said earlier on China is, 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 is you know, true and, and important. China has made progress in, in you know, decarbonizing its, its own economy at some level, uh, being a leader on, on, on solar and, and in other uh, renewable domains. Uh, at the same time, it's been funding the construction of coal plants uh, as part of the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and uh, and I think you know, and, and it continues to, in the aggregate, increase emissions uh, because it's very very much hoped that Chinese emissions will peak in this decade, but that's far from a from a foregone foregone conclusion. So I think there is a big question mark over um, the seriousness and, and and credibility of China's commitment to, to decarbonization. Thank you. I only have 20 seconds left. Um, I, I, so I'll just kind of put these for the record, but I do have a question I'll submit to you, uh, Dr. Rohawk, about the Three Seas Initiative and, yep. uh, and the new LNG terminal, as well as uh, Chairman Keating and I, uh, we led the European Energy Security and Diversification Act, and I have some questions about that. But since there's other people that want to ask questions, and I, I want to thank you and the witnesses and the chairman for holding this. I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the ranking member now, recognize uh, the vice chair of the committee, uh, Representative Spanberger. Thank you, Chairman Keating. Uh, thank you to the witnesses for being here. Dr. Nam, congratulations on your citizenship. Uh, I appreciate the framing of today's conversation, particularly on such an important topic. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant heartbreak and loss across our country and the world, and loss of life, lasting health conditions, economic hardship, isolation, and, and so many other elements. Um, and as we continue to talk about what it will take to grow out of this pandemic, um, I really appreciate the framing of today's conversations. So um, Dr. Nama, I'd like to begin with you. In your view, the types of investments that countries can make to bounce back more quickly from this investment, uh, and following up on, on Congressman Kinzinger's question, can you talk a little bit about how efforts to be more resilient moving forward can actually also be an element of how we compete internationally? Um, and, and just a little bit more significantly there, um, you know, the economic recovery spending that we're going to make and have made as we invest in sectors uh, that present economic opportunity, I'm, I'm wondering where is that, as you view it, that real benefit in climate and national security benefits uh, in terms of our, our international competition? Uh, thank you for that question. I think um, I think there's sort of two aspects to it, right? 
um, what we're seeing internationally, even though commitments are falling short of where they should be to fix this problem, is, is a very sort of strategic effort in Asia and Europe to basically fill out, use this opportunity to fill out parts of the domestic sort of clean energy infrastructure and supply chain that are currently not very well supported. And so that is technologies that are not very well supported or are early stages like hydrogen. Um, that is a sort of a way of reducing reliance on, on China, for instance, in Europe with the battery consortium that's trying to sort of kickstart a European battery industry. Um, and so there's so that's sort of one side of it, right? So sort of using this time and, and the money that is being spent to complete and be more competitive in industries that, that countries are agreeing on uh, on being important going forward. I think that the sort of a separate debate is what um, support for clean energy technology markets domestically will do in terms of employment. And I think in that debate in the past, we focused a lot on the reliance on China and sort of China's dominance in manufacturing and our wish to bring manufacturing back. And that is a valid concern. Um, I, I think where we've been missing uh, emphasis in the conversation in this country has been on how many jobs are actually not in manufacturing in these industries. And so those are the kinds of blue collar jobs that we've long been talking about are being lost, the sort of local construction jobs. Um, you know, if you have wind and solar installations, there's um, a, a huge maintenance and installation employment opportunity. Um, there are related service industries in these sectors. Um, all of these infrastructure projects and building retrofits have construction jobs. And so uh, there's a sort of international competitiveness aspect, but I think there's also a debate we should have about what kinds of jobs we will get, regardless of where we are currently in terms of uh, you know, manufacturing competitiveness in these sectors. And so I think that's um, that's um, both important and probably, you know, would require sort of a two-pronged approach of creating markets and filling out um, filling our, com out our competitiveness. I think historically we've been incredibly good at research and development. We also have very good institutions for universities to spin off new technologies into startup companies where we've been less competitive. It's financing these startup companies to the point where they can scale these technologies and then actually manufacture and deploy them in this country. And so that gap, I think we haven't fixed uh, for the most part. Thank you so much, Dr. Nam. And I'm, I'm looking for my timekeeping bubble, so I don't see it, Mr. Chairman. You might have to interrupt me as I approach. 52 seconds. Uh, okay. Um, so I, I would just like to comment then, rather than go into additional uh, conversation. Uh, Dr. Nam, thank you very much for bringing the conversation, not just about the manufacturing, but also the jobs that would come uh, to the United States if we were to really, really focus um, on, on building out uh, greater resiliency, everything from uh, making major investments in uh, renewable energy, the the power grids that go along with that, and and the maintenance of of such uh, efforts. I want to thank all of the uh, witnesses, and I do not want to run over time. Um, I'm grateful for you all being there, being here today, and thank you for what you're bringing to this conversation, and thank you for all of your work uh, and research. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Representative. The chair now recognizes Representative Burchett of Tennessee. Are you with us still, Representative Burchett? Uh, then uh, we'll come back to you in order. The chair recognizes uh, Representative Cicilline from Rhode Island. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for this excellent testimony. I'd like to sort of build on Congressman Spanberger's question uh, and ask you, uh, Mr. Norton, uh, Morton, I'm sorry. You know, we I think we think of these issues as we're thinking about um, climate, the climate crisis in, in kind of three specific ways as it relates to COVID-19, our economic recovery and our competitiveness, our national security, and our environmental stewardship. And I think very often people think of those things as competing and we have to make trade-offs. I wonder if you'd speak to uh, the opportunity that our being thoughtful in our response to COVID presents in terms of aligning all three of those priorities and responsibilities rather than kind of being a trade-off. 
That's a, that's a, it's a terrific question. Thank you, Congressman Cicilline. Um, and it's a big question. Um, you know, at, when, when I covered these issues at the National Security Council under uh, President Obama, we spent a lot of time thinking about, uh, thinking about the interplay between those. And I think it's no, um, it's no, uh, it's no secret that there is a strong national security um, imperative in securing uh, our um, our economic future, uh, and in securing our uh, and in mitigating the, the the greatest risks of climate change, and that that's across everything from from force force preparedness and troop readiness and uh, uh, coastal uh, resilience of coastal uh, military installations overseas, um, you know, protecting overseas supply lines, and increasingly um, and increasingly um, um, uh, difficult. Uh, uh, climate-related uh, areas. I mean, the military has been a huge proponent of developing uh, distributed generation renewable uh, solutions to power there and, and supply power to their uh, to their forward uh, posts. So um, there's there's no question that there's a strong um, uh, national security component to addressing climate change, um, and there is an equally strong argument to be to be made for. Uh, addressing climate change because of the human displacement uh, factor that is coming, that we see coming already uh, related to environmental refugees. And we will see many, many more of these in the years to come. And that will have an impact on our national security undeniably, because it will put pressure on our borders, on the borders of our of our allies, uh, as it already has, and we've we've seen that. Uh, and so, just at a high level, I think there's no there's there's not really a debate again around the, the the question that climate change will have bearing and is having bearing already on national security at the margin. That those 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 uh, those those uh, pressures will will only increase. Um, I think with re, with re, the, the the advantage we have now is we do have this. We've called it once in a generation, once in a you know whether it's once in a generation once in a decade it's it's once in a long time period to deploy significant amounts of 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 of, of public capital in a way that can both address environmental considerations address national security considerations and help us rebuild and in is in a way that is consistent with the clear direction of global policy travel and technology innovation and so i think this would be a tremendous missed opportunity and the numbers that dr nam just just shared you know only seven percent of our stimulus funds collectively going to kind of climate or green related um, uh, rebuilding. That's a real concern. If we're using this moment to reinvest in the status quo, which we know is unsustainable from a national security perspective, from an environmental perspective, um, why are we doing that? That's not an efficient and effective use of public resources. So look forward. Um, that's yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I, Dr. Nam, I wanna get my last question to you. Um, Offshore wind is a, a particularly exciting opportunity for my state. We have the first offshore wind farm in America. And as you know, the Europeans have been doing this since uh, they were first installed in Denmark in 1991. And I'm just wondering whether or not um, you can speak to kind of the employment opportunities, the economic gains that uh, offshore wind uh, uh, can provide, and also how places in Europe have resolved these kind of challenges of mixed or shared use with uh, other industries, particularly with, sh with fishing, and finally, whether or not there are countries more broadly we should be looking at in terms of the COVID-19 response uh, that have done really smart, you know, whether it's South Korea or, or members of the European Union, that the U.S. should be looking to kind of as some examples. So those are two separate questions, but I wanted to get them in because I know the chairman will give you as much time as you need to answer them. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was just going to ask that question about timing. So in terms of um, offshore wind and um, and employment, I think, you know, I think uh, Congressman Keating also has uh, has offshore wind in his district. There's there's really a whole they're, they're, they're beginning to think about doing it. The first wind farm is, of course, off the shore of Rhode Island. But go ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I um I think we need to think about this as a whole ecosystem of, of jobs that is created as a result of this, right? And so this goes down to the um, the local metal welding companies that are welding together the pylons on which these uh, turbines are being constructed. A lot of the components are being shipped from all over the world, but the construction of these and the sort of assembly of these large uh, turbines actually has to happen locally. You need to have a port, uh, a maintenance facility for these 
for these turbines. Um, you have the people with the food trucks that are selling lunch to the port workers that are shipping the repair equipment to the turbines. And so I think we really need to think about the whole chain of um, uh, off employment opportunities that that exist there. Uh, when I was doing my PhD at MIT, there were a lot of debates about the, the Cape Wind project at the time, and I know that Rhode Island that you know forged ahead. Um, but we had, we interviewed a lot of local companies and, and all sorts of different businesses that were banking on this project happening and hoping for economic opportunity, going to, all the way down to steel tank companies that were, you know, doing propane tanks, but had now acquired the sort of capability of welding for these things. And so this can have a large impact on many different kinds of businesses. And uh, I don't want to go over too much, but maybe one more point. If you think about the same amount of power generated, say, in a coal power plant, there's actually not a lot of employment in that particular plant, right? There might be employment in mining and so on earlier on. but. Uh, on average, renewable energy installations have no fuel costs, but instead employ a lot of labor and, and maintenance and, and the sort of infrastructure that happens around it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. We're going to see if uh, Representative Burchett was able to get back on. I'm here. Oh, great. Chair recognizes uh, Representative Burchett from Tennessee. I know you couldn't tell if it was me or not, Mr. Chairman, because as I've stated, this unnatural light doesn't capture my beauty that is so so uh, uh, misplaced in these videos. Well, we won't ask the witnesses to comment on that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Rohack uh, a question, if it'd be all right. Um, do you think it's a good idea to expand the development Finan um, development finance corporations mandate to allow for the funding of nuclear projects. I, th I think it is. So when you look at Eastern Europe, uh, the number of countries that are either considering or in the process of actually expanding their, their nuclear operations. Uh, and uh, by and large, uh, Russian companies, especially Rosatom, uh, have had the upper hand in bidding for those contracts. Uh, in Hungary, the Pax 2 expansion has been given to Rosatom without going through a competitive tender. Uh, now, Poland obviously is considering opening up to six new nuclear reactors. Uh, and, and so, so for Westinghouse and, and US companies more broadly, uh, this has been a challenge. Um, the question is so, so there is the Exim Bank, which I think can play an important role. With DFC, uh, the, the, the question is, like, you know, how far can this mandate go? Because obviously many of these countries are, uh, they uh, you know, are no longer developing countries. So, so I think within the DFC mandate, there would be only Bulgaria and Romania that would count uh, as, 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 as possible uh, candidates for eligible for funding among, among these countries. Uh, Romania, by the way, is has now scrapped an agreement with, with the Chinese and uh, is looking for new new bidders for, for the expansion of its, its reactor in, in Cernavoda. Um, so I think it's important uh, that, the, that the U.S. is in this game. Um, I think it's equally important that the U.S. is in the game for um, the supply of, of nuclear fuel to these plants. Uh, so Westinghouse has a plant in Sweden, um, which has created a consortium with various European institutions with EU funding trying to provide safe uh, fuel supply for the Soviet-style reactors that were, that were installed by, by Rosatom. I think it's important that this be also given uh, attention by, by, by U.S. policymakers, because I think it's very much in our interest that especially smaller European countries uh, do not become dependent on Russian energy, whether it takes the form of, of natural gas or, or indeed nuclear power. Did I, did I hear you say correctly early on that the Russians have the advantage in the bidding process, you cut out a little bit, and I wasn't sure if that's what you said or not. Yes, um, partly that might have to do with sort of you know historical legacies and the presence of of of, of, of Rosatom in these in these economies, uh, but also on the cost basis, uh, it's been uh, yeah the, the the sort of offers submitted submitted by by Rosatom have tended to be uh, cheaper than than the than the U.S. or more broadly Western. Solutions.
I think we have another uh, uh, technical difficulty uh, there. Uh, let's just pause for a minute and see if that comes back. Uh, and if you if you can, uh, Representative Burchard, if you have questions of another witness, uh, perhaps you could ask those now. That, that's okay, Mr. Chairman. I'm good. I'll yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you for your patience, sir. Well, well thank you, and thank you for your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, we're also having technical difficulty. Uh, see if Mr. Costa is back. Uh, if not, uh, we'll uh, ask uh, Representative Gonzalez uh, if he has any questions. Mr. Chairman, it's Tim Burchett again. It might help when we get off. It says I'm, there's a bandwidth problem. If we would, maybe if we, after we finish our questions, if we get off, that might help. I'm not sure. Well, thank you. Uh, if people are off, perhaps you might want to get off because of a bandwidth issue. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Burchett, you're far more advanced than I am at uh, even spotting these things. Uh, see if that helps. Uh, again, uh, I think we have. Uh, Representative uh, Costa, Gonzalez, and then Sherman. Uh, if Representative Sherman will ask unanimous consent uh, uh, that he join us. Uh, Representative Sherman, how are you doing technologically? Doing just fine. Uh, right, Chair, recognize Representative Sherman for questions. Oh, I uh, <laughs> I just want to thank you for for holding the hearing. I thought my uh, time to ask questions would be uh, at the end. Are we at the end? Well, uh, you're technologically at, at the forefront in terms of uh, having access. Uh, why, don't, why don't I pass to the end? I want to hear what other people have to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will. Uh, thank you. I, I just recognize myself for a couple of things I didn't get to ask that I, I thought might come up in the questionings. May they might have, especially Dean Kite uh, and, and oh, Dr. Mann. Who's up? I'm sorry. Representative Cost, are you on? Or? No. Let's pause. Listen, let's everyone pause for a second. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was a full. Oh, okay. Um. I'm, All right, I'm going to. I'm trying to be on. on. Can you hear me? Question if I could. Is this Representative Costa? Representative Gonzalez? Here, uh, uh, Chairman. Ah, Representative Gonzalez, there you are. Hey. You're now recognized for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for Mr. Morton. Uh, Mr. Morton, based on your work on uh, the National Security Council, how would you shift away from fossil fuels uh, that affect our national security and our environment? And are there particular energy sources that would allow us to maintain energy and independence during a transition to renewables? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Gonzalez, for your question. I mean, I, I think I think the first thing to recognize is that um, We've come a long way in the last in the last 10 years. And if you look at the trajectory and pace of travel that we are already on, it is it is significant and it's and it's more than most people recognize. So I'm not saying we should rest on our laurels, but it's worth worth realizing that in the past two years, if you look at the US, uh, the percentage of new uh, annual uh, power generation installed capacity each year has been about 75 percent for renewable energy over fossil fuel. And that's a market driven, that's a market driven movement, right? We're, we're right. we are already installing three quarters, almost three quarters of our annual energy installation capacity each year is renewable energy, largely in the form of solar and wind. So that's happening. Uh, and, and it's producing good jobs and it's producing jobs that can't be outsourced on the service side. Fastest growing jobs uh, uh, segments in the US in the last two years, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics were solar pho photovoltaic install installers and wind turbine technicians. So that's happening, uh, but it's not happening at the speed that it could, and it's not happening at the speed I think that that the um, that the market demands and that and that economic support. 
Um, and so there's a lot further we can go there. In terms of next generation, looking forward, um, you know, I think energy storage uh, in particular, how we actually ensure that there's a smoothing of the of of, um, of solar and wind supply um, uh, is so energy storage, battery storage will be a huge area of competition and and long term competitive advantage. I think the hydrogen economy is clearly an area where many many economies are pointing and where we have to have, to Chairman Keating's point of view, an opinion. We need to have a a perspective and a set of policies that I think enable that. Uh, that industry because it will be huge and it will be big and it will be global. Um, so I would think that um, a continued rapid deployment of solar and wind, leaning in on geothermal, which is a, a, a tremendous resource for this country, um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and a focus on, on energy storage um, and, um, and the hydrogen economy would be areas that I would, I would prioritize on the, on the, on the uh, energy generation and energy storage fronts. So are you saying that would be enough to maintain energy independence if we made those changes that you just mentioned? Oh, I think I think energy independence is a tricky word because it means I think it means different things to different people, right? Um, you know, it, the, the global energy market is a is a um, is just that it's global. Um, sometimes we are net producers of, of that's energy what I mean. Goods, that, that's still, exactly what I mean. Are we net producers? We would be net producers during that period of transition. I think we're getting close to a point where we where we can be, and that you know whether or not that's our stated goal or whether or not that's an outcome of a of a much more uh, intentional set of uh, green growth related policies. I don't have a strong opinion on, uh, but I Thank think you. I, have, I have one more question. Several months ago, the Select uh, Committee on Climate Crisis related a report that contained policy recommendations for addressing. The climate crisis and ensuring that our transition to a greener energy mix does not leave workers and communities in energy producing states like Texas, where I where I represent, uh, behind. Dr. Nam, uh, what steps are uh, other countries taking in their green recovery package to assure that those employed in 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 and relying on traditional energy such as Texas sources are equipped to make this transition? And what steps? Are other countries taken to promote new jobs in clean energy that are distributed fairly, pay fair wages, and are integrated with trade unions? Uh, thank you for that question. If you look at the European um, recovery packages, both uh, in Germany but also at the European Union level, there are measures for what they call a just transition fund that involves both compensation but also investment in training facilities and retraining facilities to help people transition to other sources of jobs. And so, you know, that is sort of one approach that's being taken in a state like Texas, which has one of the largest wind industries in this country, there have been plenty of new opportunities that also have been created um, you know, over the past two decades. And so the question is, are these in exactly the same locations as the old jobs? And can we somehow match the technical capabilities or train people uh, in a way or give them opportunities for training um, so that they can take advantage of these new opportunities? Um, and I think I'm sort of heartened to see that the European recovery packages are, are taking that on and trying to facilitate that directly. Yeah, my concern on wind, for example, we have a wind farm uh, in the adjoining district, is that once they're built, they don't produce that many jobs uh, in the long term. In fact, that wind farm that we have next to us, I think, employs 15 people. And when you compare that to traditional energy uh, employment in the region, I just don't see how it could keep up. I mean, I'm all for it. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just I'm, that's just a concern uh, for, for people that live in, in, in Texas. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Representative. Chair recognized Representative Sherman. Question. Thank you. Um, we're all anxious to resume life. And uh, so the first bit is, yeah, how can we just go back to exactly what we were doing before COVID? But in fact, it makes a lot of sense for a country, and I see Europe doing this, to look at how are we going to rebuild better? And one area is uh, electric vehicles where you have uh, uh, like a triple chicken and egg problem. You need demand for electric vehicles so that they'll make vehicles with better range. You have range anxiety that prevents people from buying the vehicles. With fewer vehicles, you have fewer recharging stations. And if you don't have the recharging stations, that cuts uh, your range. Uh, so 
you know, it takes geniuses to invent uh, to invent uh, better batteries, and there are some geniuses working on that. Uh, but a country with a good government uh, could arrange a circumstance that when you drive to where you're going to go, you can recharge so that when you get back in your car, you've topped up uh, your electric uh, tank. Uh, what is Europe doing to make sure that where you park your car, you recharge your car? And, and I realize this is a question right out of the blue, and if, if our witnesses don't know, I'll just submit that as a question for the record. Any takers on that uh, question? Well, th this is um, uh, this is uh, 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 Rachel Kite. I mean, it's a really good question because it goes and it harks back to an earlier question about what's the role that the government needs to play. Um, and so, what what I think is is clearer <clears throat> in Europe is both a combination of car companies themselves making very explicit. Um, statements about when they will stop producing the internal combustion engine, mixed with uh, a, a policy dialogue around what is the infrastructure that should be provided in order to um, ensure that you can have a multimodal ele uh, electric or clean energy uh, transportation. So the conversation is in different countries, including the Netherlands, Germany, uh, Denmark, even now beginning in the UK, a conversation around how do you uh, decarbonize cars, uh, move people onto healthier mobility, so that's electric bikes and, uh, and public transportation. Uh, and so you're actually seeing this coming from the European Union level in terms of the package. You're talking about national conversations, but also cities are playing an important role in the European debate as well. And you have a number of cities coming forward with very, very aggressive targets around uh, how to move goods and people around the city cleanly and healthily. Uh, and, and, the, and then the car companies again take, it, take their cue from that. So I, it's I, a, I thank you for sorry. your answer for all witnesses to tell us what European countries are doing to require that uh, major parking uh, uh, lots and, 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 and structures have recharging stations, that they are consistent with the kind of technology that the cars have or adaptable to it, and that uh, uh, some, uh, so many apartment buildings uh, also in effect have parking lots or structures for their, uh, for their tenants and that they, whether they're required to have recharging because uh, I personally, uh, uh, I go to my district office, there's no place to recharge the car, and that doesn't affect me now because I've got a 10-year-old car. But uh, it's going to be very hard for me to buy an electric car or for any of the hundreds of people who work in that building uh, to do so if there's no recharging station. And that's more than you wanted to know about my district office, and I yield back. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Representative. I, I don't think uh, Representative Costa, whose district is really uh, plagued by wildfires, uh, uh, is able to reconnect. Um, but I will, there's a question that's been, uh, should be asked, uh, that I'm glad I had the opportunity to ask on this uh, round. And, and uh, Dean Kite and uh, Dr. Noam, perhaps you'd be uh, able to address this, but anyone can. Those are the, uh, that's the unintended uh, consequences of moving ahead. And, and again, the need to really strategize and make policy on this. But uh, what concerns do you have about marginalized and uh, systematically, you know, uh, disadvantaged communities, whether they're here in the U.S. or abroad, uh, being left out, and also uh, making sure that when we're doing this, it's along the lines uh, of Representative Gonzalez's concern about jobs, to make sure there's a fair distribution, fair wages, uh, integrated with unions, and and that kind of support. So, uh, it's one of the question is one of uh, uh, unintended, I think, ex exclusion and planned inclusion uh, in terms of those other factors. Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Well, I'll take a first go and then I'm sure uh, our colleagues will have more to say. Um, so first of all, uh, 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 th this is all the more reason to plan for the transition. If we can plan for the transition, then we can take care of communities who are you know, heavily invested in and have historic ties to parts of the uh, carbon intensive economy, which are not going to be competitive 
in, in the future and, and are not competitive now. And that does require uh, dialogue with those communities and it does require setting aside funds for retraining, for reskilling, for imagining what new industries can, can, can take place. And there are examples of that. Um, uh, the dialogue in Alberta uh, between unions, um, uh, global companies, local companies, provincial government and uh, government. There is also plans for just, just transition dialogues taking place in cities and counties around the United Kingdom uh, and, and across Europe, but also in South Korea and elsewhere. So this is a very important part of it. It can be planned for. We have had transitions before and we have been able to help communities through that, which brings me back to, for example, the Northeast where I live now, and, and wind. So here, you know, the, the, the detailed uh, conversation around making sure that we've got the training and the education for the skills, the blue collar and the white collar jobs, you know, the uh, expansion of the job, the amount of jobs we will lose from saying goodbye to the tail end of the carbon economy is very small in, in comparison to the number of good jobs that can be recreate, created. Think of all of the built environment that is going to have to be refurbished to be made resilient to climate change. Think of all of the electricians, the carpenters, the new materials, the, the manufacturers of those new materials, et cetera, et cetera. And then think about the future where we have green hydrogen because we have so much offshore wind that we have surplus energy. And then New Bedford is not just you know, a place where we're putting turbines out into the ocean. It's also a green energy hub that can serve the Northeast. So these are the kinds of exciting things, I think, that when you start planning for it and working through, you can take those communities behind. For developing countries who are heavily in debt and need to work their way through this crisis, there are also opportunities to both solve their indebtedness and help them in a clean recovery. And there's some interesting work going on now around thinking through uh, de debt for climate uh, swaps and things like this. But there are financial innovations that can also help inclusion at the global scale. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I think Representative Meeks has joined us. I don't know if Representative Meeks, if you have any questions. Yes, I do. Thank you very uh, much, Mr. Correct. Chairman. Uh, and Meeks. Thank you for thank you for all of the witnesses for their testimony uh, today. Um, if you could move closer to your microphone, I think uh, we're having a little trouble hearing. Can you hear me now? A little better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank all the witnesses for their testimony, uh, and uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this uh, important topic. Uh, I'd like to ask Ms. Kate that when talking about climate diplomacy, uh, international coordination is essential, uh, especially with the large growing economies such as China and India. They are committing uh, to carbon neutral futures as we are still committed to coal. Um, what will it take for the world to come together to energize our collective policies and can saving our planet be done without international political cooperation? Any, anyone? I, I think have one, uh, one point. No. Sorry, um, excuse me. Just one point. Um, international cooperation is needed now more than ever because it is a global energy economy. It is a global uh, food value chain. It, 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 we are we are only going to solve this problem together and. You know, that yesterday the Chinese government made an announcement that it aims to be uh, zero net carbon as an economy by uh, 2060 and that it hopes to reach peak emissions by 2030. This is a substantial ramping up of their ambition. And so now we have two of the three biggest emitters historically um, uh, ratcheting up their ambition, which means that there is a cooperation, it is a race to the top. And uh, I think that the danger is that for individual Americans, individual American families, communities, those of us who, who live here, uh, we want to be in that race to the top. And the, 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 despite other geopolitical tensions and despite a cooling of the atmosphere in some of the discussions between these major power blocks, the, the possibility of a race to the top would benefit everybody. Race to the top being a cleaner environment. 
Um, and so uh, the EU have now said uh, that they uh, have this new ambition. China came out, I think, surprising a lot of people with their new ambition uh, statement yesterday. And, and I think that it, it's difficult to imagine uh, how we can um, optimize for the new jobs, for the, for the um, uh, stability that we need if we're not part of that race to the top. Thank you very much. That's exactly, you know, my thoughts. The world is much smaller today than it used to be. And, you know, one thing that we share is this planet. Uh, and so, therefore, there should be a race to top by all of us, particularly the largest countries in the world and have the, that, that uses the most uh, you know, carbon. So, but, so let me ask Mr. Morton. Uh, you know, I said on both, I think there's an interconnection, the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Financial Services Committee, uh, and see money move guided by an invisible hand to where profits are. And it's often driven by short-term thinking in quarters or even maybe years, you know, this very short term. And I, reading your statement, you used a Wayne Gretzky metaphor about uh, going to where the puck is headed when describing investments. How can finance better prepare us for what's ahead so that it can be going to where the puck is headed? Uh, thank you, Congressman Meeks. Um, it's it's a great question, and I think I think before you joined, I you know I I, I highlighted the um, the the recent statements from from BlackRock about about uh, climate being being central to their investment strategy going forward. The CFTC announcement from two weeks ago about about how climate risk is a risk to the U.S. economy, a fundamental risk to the U.S. economy, unless it's unless it's uh, um, better addressed. Um, two days ago, J.P. Morgan came out with its announcement about uh, about um, uh, being essentially financing only uh, having a net zero uh, a portfolio of investments within within a, a relatively short period of time. We're beginning to see the the pieces fall in place for what will become a rush to the exit, and this is the this is the concern a uh, rush to the exit out of fossil fuels, and this is the concern that many in the financial community have had for a long time about this issue of stranded assets. When people realize that carbon is in fact this uh, liability and we, we begin to treat it what, as, as what it rightly is, which is, a, which is a, today an unpriced pollutant, which will be priced in the future and is increasingly being priced, financial remark, markets will respond not in a trickle, but in a flood. And it's really important that our financial institutions and we as investors and as uh, shareholders and as 401k holders um, begin to hold our financial institutions accountable for the carbon in their portfolio because it's going the moment of reckoning is going to come soon and uh, and, and and it's therefore um, I think Im imperative upon policymakers to send the signals to the financial institutions that this moment is coming and and that we need to harden our financial institutions against the climate and carbon risk in their portfolios. I don't think we've got 10 years before this happens. I think it's two or three years before the financial institutions really, really, really begin to price carbon in their portfolios. And then we're gonna see a flood of investment capital away from uh, climate and uh, carbon intensive economies toward green, uh, greener, greener sectors and alternatives. Thank you very much, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Representative Meeks, and uh, I'd just like to uh, have a couple uh, closing observations uh, since members uh, have asked their questions. And I want to thank the members, by the way, on a very busy morning uh, with much going on. We had nine members participating, uh, which is uh, quite a few and I think is a testament to the importance of this issue. Um, the, it, it's clear. Uh, it's clear from everything that we heard this morning. It's clear from the reality that we live in that the idea of decarbonization uh, is one that is just not an environmental issue anymore. If you just view it as such, uh, you're living in the past. It's much more than that. And it's uh, the purpose of this hearing and the purpose of this committee moving forward in a global sense to understand this, that uh, we have to uh, stop living in the past and, and having debates on how to treat it as an environmental issue and realize where we are now and where we're gonna increasingly go in the future. Now, the private sector is way ahead of this. And we've seen in the past, we have seen in the past instances where uh, the government has been a partner in the private sector, just giving opportunities uh, for incentives. And the private sector has just moved in uh, to be a partner. 
there's opportunities to increase that dramatically uh, and move away from this concept that we're just regulating out issues. Uh, uh, and also, uh, we have to look at the fact that other countries are moving ahead of us and we're being left in a wake position. Uh, you know, just as a boat goes through, we're left in the, uh, in, in the cross, uh, behind in the currents and they're ahead leading the way. Now, there's a few things we can also be sure of. In, after the conclusion of this COVID-19 crisis and as we move from dealing with the immediate concerns we are going to move unquestionably into uh, a recovery package to bring our economy back. And it's clear to everyone, I believe, that this would be the largest recovery package in the history of our country. Now, we can incorporate forward thinking in that recovery package and, and move ahead and, and do things that are important, uh, not just uh, for our own futures, but for generations to come and to maximize those efforts. Or we can move to focus that recovery package on outdated industries, industries that uh, do not have a future, but industries that might be politically connected uh, and might be clamoring uh, for resources and funds and advantages government is providing, uh, even though that's not gonna lead us to the future. So we know where we're going to end up. We're going to end up in a place uh, where we have to address carbonization and it will be addressed whether we act or not, or we can continue to muddle through being followers, losing jobs, uh, losing revenue, uh, and also uh, condemning uh, the people in this country uh, to not prospering in terms of the economic or healthcare security. So it's clear where we have to go, but government will have a role. It has to, if we're gonna ma maximize things. And it's clear uh, from the testimony of the witnesses here that that must be the case. So I really thank you for your testimony. Uh, the witnesses that uh, couldn't get on uh, will have five days to submit uh, written statements and extraneous material for the record uh, subject to the rules uh, we haven't heard the last of this and it's important we're talking about it at this time of necessity and this time of opportunity uh, and it's just important that we don't follow the path as uh, committee members know in this committee that every hearing ends up saying uh, as a concluding note well, we need a policy to go forward. We hear that in the Foreign Affairs Committee time and time and time again. What's needed is a policy. Well, that's needed here. And it's not just empty words on a piece of paper. It's a strategic plan moving forward, working with the private sector, working with our global allies. Uh, and uh, we can be bystanders uh, or we can be leaders. Uh, I think we have no choice to be the latter. So thank you so much to our witnesses for being here. Thank the committee members. Uh, this is one of the most important issues uh, we're dealing with and will be dealing with in the years to come. Uh, and uh, we haven't heard the last from all of you. Thank you for your participation. With that, this hearing's closed.